thank you, Roy. Our next speaker is um, <coughs> Gary Adan Adamkowitz from the Harvard School of Public Health. Thanks, Gary, for joining us. Okay. Uh, thanks, Terry, and thanks for the organizers for the opportunity to be here. Um, so you can see I, I'm going to try to talk about a very big issue in the space of a few minutes. Uh, what I'd like to do is provide some framing thoughts for how we think about uh, disparity issues in relation to indoor exposure to PM, uh, use some of our data on uh, secondhand smoke uh, exposures uh, leading to indoor PM, and then close with a few thoughts on how uh, some of what we're seeing in terms of intervention research is also relevant to, to this discussion. So I want to start with the big picture, in this case, a big picture made up of a lot of little pictures. Uh, we've already um, talked today about a lot of different issues uh, relevant to indoor exposures, some of them represented up here. Um, but I just want to use this slide to make two points. One is that for pretty much everything up here, there's a potential disparity story. Uh, in terms of how individuals, uh, communities might be more heavily exposed. Um, in many ways, uh, indoor exposures are hidden from view, and we've spent uh, many, many years uh, appropriately addressing outdoor air pollution and addressing that with policy. But uh, there are many examples where, on a daily basis, people are exposed to very high levels of some of the pollutants we uh, uh, no cause health effects, and we don't haven't really addressed those issues. So just as an example, uh, looking at cooking-related exposures, uh, just thinking about gas and electric stoves, if you really want to think about disparities, you know, you have to think about ventilation equipment, uh, the type, the age, the condition of ventilation equipment in kitchens. If you think about stoves, the type, the usage of kitchens on a daily basis, uh, use of stoves on a daily basis. Also, um, when you think about sources that may be constant, so if, you, if everyone in the US had the same stove, uh, you could imagine disparities being generated by just the homes that they're in. And so we, we uh, in most of my research, I work in public housing, low-income housing, and in many cases, you have an open kitchen connected to a living room, you're basically looking at one primary living space that's, that's open. And that also affects the likely exposures that a family might experience on any given day. Uh, and of course, I have pictures of outdoor air pollution. Once again, if everyone had the same, uh, lived in the same style uh, house, but those houses were placed in very different communities with different outdoor exposures to PM, you would have a disparity story there, never mind all of the issues with what's happening indoors. So this is all uh, to say that I think we need to always consider the multi, we need a multi-level view of uh, the determinants of exposure to indoor pollutants. How does a household embed within a building, embed within a neighborhood? And I think I'm glad uh, Lynn brought up the issue of secondhand smoke in multifamily housing this morning. Um, so we have to think not only about the neighborhood in terms of local traffic, but there's the indoor neighborhood. Uh, so we work in a lot of uh, large multifamily buildings where uh, the air you are breathing is some mixture of everything that's happening in every other uh, unit inside the building. So. Uh, that context really is important in terms of thinking about what shapes the daily, the time series that you might see indoors. Um, and so breaking this down, these are, um, you know, looking at the, thinking about everything that's been raised today, I think you can start to, there are days when you feel like some of these issues are, uh, are intractable, but they're not. We, we actually don't know everything about the health effects of every indoor exposure, but we know a lot about PM and its health effects. But we also know a lot about uh, buildings and sources in a way that can address some of these important disparities. So I think it's important to really think mechanistically that it's not just about measuring exposures in low-income communities, but about understanding the side by the determinants, either 
the time variant determinants or the static determinants that shape those exposures. And we don't always do a good job of ca capturing those things. So, you know, it, these are not uh, new concepts to the, to the folks in the room, but thinking about cooking appliances, tobacco smoke, cleaning products, all of these things. Um, and when I say settings, I'm thinking about where does the home sit? So there's sort of the, the very local neighborhood and the larger neighborhood in terms of shaping uh, some of these exposures we care about. So I just want to provide some thoughts uh, in terms of big picture, thinking about building systems and ventilation, uh, also thinking about individual sources and how they may be uh, associated with socioeconomic status, and I can, I can highlight some of the work that we've done. So in terms of housing type, multifamily, single family, um, in many cases, this is not news, but uh, uh, multifamily dwellings that house uh, low-income families have a lot of deferred maintenance issues. Uh, there is that community level exposure that I mentioned, the size, condition, occupancy. Occupancy is another really important issue, I think, for many of the exposures that we've talked about today. So it's not just about the square footage of the home, but how many people are occupying that space. And you can draw a line to through uh, products that are brought into the home, humidity levels in the home, usage of particular sources in the home. All of those lines are not that difficult to draw and try to understand, but we don't always capture those in studies. Uh, in terms of air exchange and ventilation systems, um, we work in a lot of um, housing stock that doesn't have uh, mechanical systems for ventilation. So, um, and where there may have been uh, some systems for ventilation of the bathroom, they don't necessarily work. And in most cases, we're going into homes that have recirculating fans in the kitchen that were installed decades ago and have never been fully uh, used to their, to their potential or maintained. So all of those things matter. Uh, the presence of uh, air conditioning systems, which can provide some protection from outdoor exposures. Once again, that's another variable that maps onto SES clearly. Um, and if you think about how that might vary both uh, regionally in the US and with income, uh, we actually have data on that. So we have some ability to try to understand those issues, even if we're not incorporating those, uh, that information into all of our studies. Uh, once again, cooking fuel, equipment, spot ventilation, um, we see, we still see a lot of uh, situations where families are using stoves for supplemental heating. So another, another potential issue related to NOx and PM exposure. And I'm gonna spend some time talking about smoking, but you can imagine how all of these factors are related to, in some way to SES. So the multifamily effect. So if you are both in multifamily housing and you're in that local building neighborhood that has higher smoking prevalence, higher smoking activity, all of those things push you to the wrong side of the curve. Uh, and just to give a sense of um, the fact that for some uh, variables that are housing related, we do have data. This is data from the American Housing Survey. These aren't all, these are, you know, housing variables that in some way are related to indoor exposures. Not all of these are related to specifically to indoor PM. So, area, you know, peeling paint, but the age of the home, water leaks, being in a neighborhood with a heavy street noise or traffic, industry close by, uh, heating issues, floor area, and pretty much all of these, it's not a surprise, but uh, the ratio of prevalence from um, of low income to high income is all in the, in the wrong direction. And the only one that's less than one is mean floor area. So not, not a surprise. So two other key variables that I think uh, are important to uh, highlight. So leakage or air exchange. This is data from Chan from 2005. Uh, these are all single family homes showing that low income homes have higher normalized leakage. Um, once again, these are single family homes in multifamily settings. We see uh, effects on both sides of the curve. Um, the other thing that's important here, I think, to recognize is that 
uh, we should talk about structural air exchange inf infiltration and then functional. So we also see a lot of situations where because of the condition of the building or the condition of heating in the building, you see enhanced ventilation. So an overheated building in, in the Northeast, uh, which, you know, walk around Boston on a January day and you'll see a lot of open windows on top floors. And in some ways, I think because those issues are also issues we need to address, we also should recognize that if we address them, we may then see disparities in exposure, right? So in some ways, there are cases where enhanced ventilation due to these deficiencies are masking a problem, a source problem, uh, that would be seen if you fix the heating problem. So uh, this, I think, is not a trivial issue to address. And uh, so if you think about that intersection between building, buildings, energy, exposure, and health, uh, it gets a little complicated. And once again, this isn't, if you think about resident volume, but looking at unit area, once again, not a surprise that low income um, shifted toward, toward smaller homes. Um, so if you think about all of these different determinants, I think we, we need a framework to understand how these things work together mechanistically. So if you imagine five variables, five determinants of indoor air quality, that either additively or, uh, uh, or in some other way contribute to your indoor exposure, if four out of the five sh put you, push you to the wrong side of the curve, you can imagine how that acts in concert to increase your exposure. So a lot of people now are talking about cumulative risk, but I think we should think about exposure assessment and the multiple factors that push you to the wrong side of the curve. And many of these things are related to SES. So it's not just about one variable. It's not just that you're using your stove to heat. It's not just that you have a small apartment or that you're in public housing. But it's the combination of things. We've actually published some data showing that even within public housing, the number of environmental problems you have in your home is related to poor self-reported health. So all of these things do work together. Um, this is um, some data from um, a study we published a few years ago where we used some modeling uh, techniques. This was uh, in collaboration with John Levy and Patricia Fabian at BU, where we used CONTAM uh, modeling, created a reduced form of that, and then looked at the variable, in the inputs to that model that might be related to indoor air quality, like smoking rates and gas stove usage. Outdoor air quality, we actually took 10 years of Boston outdoor air quality data and ramped it up and ramped it down. And so then what we did is we took this ensemble of results and broke the, uh, the, the individual elements into quartiles. And so what we saw is something you would expect. So the highest quartile of indoor PM concentrations, most of that was related to the indoor PM fraction. Now, once again, not a surprise. You have more smoking indoors, you have less air exchange, you have more uh, cooking indoors, you're gonna push yourself to the wrong side of the curve. But what is important here, I think, is to think about the fact that there, there are more variables that are, hap that are uh, related to what is happening indoors and the, and the condition and function of the building that probably shape your indoor exposure. And so Boston's not the most polluted city, in the country, but you know, doubling, if you have very high air exchange and double the air pollution in Boston, uh, you're not, those aren't the people with the highest levels in this kind of modeling. And this was just the follow up to that. So if you compare the high PM to the low PM quartiles, you can see how they distribute by air exchange, and you probably can't read all this, and smoking and outdoor air pollution. But the message is that the biggest drivers were some of these indoor factors. So even at very high air pollution outdoors and high air exchange, uh, it was about these indoor factors. The other thing I wanted to touch on is time activity, which is another variable which can map onto SES. Uh, this is a, a um, study from 2015. I think this is a Canadian study looking at urban and rural uh, individuals by age. And this is also critically important when we're thinking about 
uh, disparities issues and low SES. And so understanding the community that you're focused on in terms of their daily time activity is critically important. And if you think about low income seniors, there are a lot of chances for those individuals to be highly exposed and they're also highly vulnerable. So if you think about the, uh, that chain of events leading to health effects that we should care about, these are really important uh, microenvironments to, to focus on. So I wanna spend a few minutes looking at, uh, talking about smoking and some data from the literature as well as our own in, in Boston. So it's not news that smoking is a big uh, contributor to uh, PM 2.5. This is data from a senior housing apartment uh, a development in Arizona. So once again, the, the highest levels uh, for those who are smokers. If you look at the living room versus the indoor outdoor ratio and these uh, symbols denote the smokers, the smokers are all in this upper quadrant. So no doubt uh, smoking a big contributor to indoor uh, PM 2.5. When we've looked at in, uh, PM 2.5 levels in common areas in multifamily housing in Boston, we've seen uh, a, few, a few things. One is, so this is PM 2.5 winter and summer, nicotine, uh, using the passive method uh, from Kathy Hammond's lab, winter and summer. We looked at, there are a few things we noticed. One is that we saw much higher levels we saw higher levels of PM 2.5 and nicotine in the winter, which makes sense. This is another opportunity to do better on understanding people's time activity and their behavior on a daily basis. Um, one thing we, we also saw is that the highest levels of nicotine and, for P, and PM 2.5 were in elder disabled units. So for those who aren't familiar with uh, federally subsidized public housing, in most cases, the units are divided by family housing and elder disabled. But this, I think, um, and in other, um, in other data, some of the highest levels of indoor PM 2.5 I've seen were actually in some of these elder sites. So if you think about higher smoking prevalence and time activity, which put people at home more, you could be a very highly exposed non-smoker in that setting. And so this is, I feel, is a very underappreciated issue. This is also more data from that work where we looked at the association between PM 2.5 and nicotine. And you only see, uh, you only start to see an association at very high levels of PM, at higher levels of PM 2.5. This is actually adjusted by outdoor. And these, all these points here actually are in these elder disabled units. So I think this is a, a very underappreciated setting in terms of uh, indoor exposures. Um, this relationship between the building and the sources, I just wanna highlight one uh, slide uh, that came out of the CDC Green Housing Study. This is actually out of Cincinnati. Uh, Tina Raponin and I uh, led the first two sites in the, this study. Uh, if you look at green versus control, you actually don't see uh, markedly lower uh, levels of PM 2.5 in the green units. And that's probably related to the fact that the green units had a higher prevalence of smokers in the home. So this is another really important mes message that it's not just about the buildings, but it's about the activity. And in terms of uh, smoking is often the elephant in the room for a lot of the studies that we have worked on. So understanding uh, fixing buildings isn't necessarily gonna lower exposures despite our, our interest. Another example of the kind of analysis I think we should do, the, Teresa Chaheen and John Levy worked on this a few years ago, which was a modeling effort trying to take American housing survey data and other uh, data on activities and smoking prevalence and trying to model indoor PM 2.5 concentrations. And this was one of their results by income. They did a very simple box model. They themselves would say there are a lot of caveats here but it allows you some ability to do what if scenarios and try to understand what's happening at the population level and can we glean any information from this kind of effort. Um, in the last few minutes, I wanna focus on, uh, this is real time data we've collected from uh, two, uh, from in unit public housing sites. The, uh, the dark line show uh, a smoker's apartment 
The gray line is a unoccupied um, apartment next door, and you can see some of the transfer of smoking from one apartment to another, once again, proving the obvious. Um, but what we also did was try to compare the activity in one apartment with the levels we were seeing in another. So the smokers in this study were enrolled to record every smoking event. And what we did is actually compared what happened when we, were, we had one enrolled subject in a neighboring apartment and we compared their levels to the smoking events reported here. And if you look at, these are real-time data, so we looked at the percentiles. Of course, during the smoking hours within the smokers' homes, you can see a really significant effects at the higher percentiles because of these smoking events. But if you do the same for adjacent non-smokers, you also start to see PM 2.5 levels that are very high during these events. So, you know, unseen to the person over here, we're recording smoking events and you can see the levels of PM 2.5. Once again, you know, not news in terms of smoking moving from one place to another, but this is really understudied and underappreciated in terms of uh, our uh, understanding of disparities. And I'll skip that. Uh, there are, a, of course, a lot of studies out there that measure indoor levels and personal levels of PM 2.5. Uh, this is from the TEACH study in New York showing, much, showing higher levels of indoor uh, PM 2.5 in the fall and the winter. This is TEACH from, uh, wait a minute, that was, sorry, that was Los Angeles, this is New York. Um, and the reason I wanted to show this is that there are, if we want to gain insight on the factors that are relevant for low SES families, uh, not every study out there has in its headline, you know, that it was a disparity study or low income, and that embedded in a lot of the studies we already have on the table is information uh, relevant to this issue. And so it takes some uh, bit of digging to sort of understand, in this case, in New York, these were teenagers who were commuting by subway and bus. So once again, an activity you would expect in, a lot, in some urban areas to be more pronounced among low SES individuals. So what can we learn from these kinds of studies? I think I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. So uh, I'm not going to talk about interventions. That, that's Brett's job. But I just want to finish with uh, a thought on the fact that we need to think beyond places, think about people, places, and policies if we're going to reduce some of these indoor exposures and reduce these, these disparities. Uh, from a green housing intervention that we published, uh, two studies, 2014, 2015, we saw pretty dramatic reductions in indoor PM 2.5 between the conventional and the green. Um, and this is really, I think, a great example of how uh, better ventilation, elimination of smoking, and reduction of infiltration of outdoor particles work together to reduce indoor exposures. And so we, uh, all of these buildings had smoke-free policies. Smoke-free policies aren't perfect. I can tell you lots of stories about that. Uh, but it did, do, it did allow some reduction in indoor PM 2.5. On the, part, on the filters, we actually looked at sulfur levels to see whether we were seeing a reduction in infiltration of outdoor particles. So this is, I think, as I said, an example of you have a tight building shell reducing infiltration. You have a smoke-free policy killing a major indoor PM 2.5 source. And together, that results in a 40% decline in indoor levels. So once again, it's not just about the buildings. It's about all these other approaches. And if you look at our data on one housing site in Boston, we see pretty dramatic differences in PM 2.5 exposures based on uh, factors that we know to be relevant. So, so moving like three blocks from here to here, if you're in conventional or green, we see different PM 2.5 levels. If you have smoking in the household or, or, or not, if you have Cooking, we just saw maybe the levels aren't different, but we saw a little change in the variability. So the, this is all within the same neighborhood. So this, we shouldn't think about neighborhood factors as being the only thing that's relevant here. All of these indoor household level or building level 
building level factors matter. So just some final thoughts. Uh, I think the biggest thing we really need to, to get a grapple on is behavior, understanding how people are both in terms of time activity and their behavior in the home, what, what sources they're using, are they using ventilation equipment, do they have ventilation equipment, recognizing subpopulations, rural, urban, elderly. Uh, there's a lot that we should be doing in terms of intervention research uh, for things that are already happening, housing improvements, weatherization, smoke-free policies. HUD's new proposal on all public housing in the US going smoke-free is perhaps one of the biggest maybe indoor PM 2.5 interventions ever, if you could get it, if you get it to work. So there's an amazing opportunity to uh, see what difference you can actually make. And I'm over, so I'll finish there, thanks.